two six through sixteen. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swelling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And below the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find a babe wrapped in dwelling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. And it came, wait. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, Let us now go, even unto Bethlehem, and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in the manger. I know that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem a long time ago. He set an example for us throughout his life. He atoned for our sins. He was crucified on the cross and then he was resurrected. He came for me and he came for you. Because he came, I can return to my lovely home. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist Church this morning. It's great to see you guys in the house of the Lord today. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. We're so thankful for the hope that we have in Christ. It's my prayer today, Father, that you will be in the service, that we can feel your presence, that we can study your word, that we can be filled with the truth that is contained in the scriptures. Be with Derek as he leads us. Be with Brother Doug as he shares from your word. And help us to be open and receptive to what you have for us today. Amen. I want y'all to stand and sing with me. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, let's all sing together. Let's sing. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light above thy deep. The silent stars go by, yet in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Oh, Today we hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. You may be seated.
I am. Let's all stand. We're going to sing We Three Kings of Orient R. I want some energy. Here we go. All right, guys, let's sing it. We Three Kings of Orient R. Bearing gifts, we travel. 
It is our responsibility, Lord, to go tell the world about Jesus Christ. We're so thankful for this opportunity today to be in your presence. We're so thankful for the opportunity to be in each other's presence. We give you praise for that. We're glad to be in the house of the Lord. Bless our pastor as he brings the word of God. Anoint him to speak truth. Anoint him to speak it boldly. We thank you for sending your son that makes all of this gospel possible. And we give you praise for every good and perfect gift that you've given us. We bless you because of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Tears are falling, 
hearts are breaking how we need to hear from God you've been promised we've been waiting welcome home the child welcome home Good morning and Merry Christmas. It is my joy to welcome you to First Baptist Church on this third Sunday in December as we continue to celebrate this most wonderful time of the year. If you've been worshiping with us throughout the month of December or been watching by means of television or various means of social media, you may be aware that I've been preaching a series of sermons entitled The X's of Christmas. The prefix X comes from a Latin and means out of. It is my prayer that we might glean some important insights out of this series of sermons that will enhance our knowledge of and appreciation for this sacred season. 
The first sermon of this series was entitled, Examining Christmas. Now there's certain things about this sacred event we will never fully fathom. But then there are other things that every person needs to know about Christmas. And so we looked at five things every person needs to know about Christmas. The, that, the first one was the prophecies. We looked at some Old Testament prophecies that left no room for doubt that Jesus was and is the long-awaited Messiah. Every prophecy was perfectly fulfilled in the birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We then looked at the place. It is significant to note that Jesus was not born in Rome, the political capital of the world. He was not born in Athens, Greece, the cultural capital of the world. And he was not even born in Jerusalem, the spiritual capital of the world. Instead, he was born in the tiny town of Bethlehem. And then we moved on to look at the people. The angels announced the birth of Jesus, not to prominent political or religious leaders, but rather to the lowest form of blue collar workers of that day. I'm referring, of course, to the shepherds. And then we focused on the person of Christmas. That, of course, is Jesus Christ. And we concluded by looking at the purpose of Christmas, that Jesus came to save his people from their sin. Well, last week's message was entitled, Expecting Christmas. And two of the persons whose lives were totally consumed with the concept of expecting Christmas were Joseph and Mary. Three of the things this young couple did as they anticipated the arrival of Jesus were they pondered, that is, they carefully considered the visit from the angels and the fact that they had been selected to serve as the earthly parents of the Savior. They prayed. You can believe they prayed. They prayed for wisdom. They prayed for strength. They prayed for patience to deal with all the people, the rumors that must have been circulating about them during that period of history. And then we looked at the fact that they also praised. They praised God that they've been selected to play prominent roles in the cast of Christmas. This morning, I want to share with you the third message in this series. I've entitled it, Experiencing Christmas. The text I want to invite you to turn with me to this morning is Matthew chapter 2, and I'll read verses 1 through 12, so you please follow in your copy of the Word of God. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel." Then Herod called the, wise, called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact hour the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and of incense and of myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. The passage of scripture we've just read has traditionally been referred to as the story of the wise men. And there are a couple of questions we might consider regarding this biblical narrative. The first is, why is this story in the Bible? And secondly, what does this story have to do with the birth of Jesus? Well, those of you who grew up attending church, particularly during the month of December, have probably always associated the wise men with the celebration of Christmas. The birth of Jesus is certainly something special to celebrate. After all, wouldn't you agree that this was one of the most important events in history? And yet in spite of its significance, there is actually very little information found about the birth of Jesus in the pages of the New Testament. Surprisingly, neither Mark nor John provide any details regarding the birth of Jesus. Everything we know about this exciting event came from the writings of Matthew and Luke. 
Now, it is interesting that Matthew begins his account of the gospel with a genealogy of Jesus. This is found in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And after providing details related to Jesus' family background, Matthew concludes chapter 1 by saying that Mary gave birth to a son and they named him Jesus. I mean, that's all he said about the entrance of the Son of God into the world. But then Matthew goes on in the following chapter, chapter two, to devote several verses to the story of the Magi who came to visit Jesus. It is interesting to me to know that Matthew said so little about the birth of Jesus and yet said so much about the visit these men made to see Jesus. So the question that begs to be answered is, why would Matthew include this story? I know that you're probably familiar with how the wise men followed the star and they brought gifts to Jesus, but have you ever really taken time to reflect on this visit? And these gentlemen called the wise men and the gifts they brought to Jesus. And don't you think that these were some rather strange gifts to bring to a child? And what you may find even more strange is that all of this biblical narrative has traditionally been featured in nativity scenes, it is not really a Christmas story. This is a post-Christmas story. When you review the historical context of this story, it becomes immediately apparent that Jesus had already been born. In fact, he's not even a newborn. When the so-called wise men arrived, Jesus may have been as old as one and a half to two years of age. Now, I remember the first time I was confronted with this information. And I just want you to know that it was shocking to me. I was 18 years of age. We had an interim pastor. We were between senior pastors, so we had an interim pastor. He was a professor at Mississippi College. And on Sunday morning, he talked about the fact that the wise men were not there when Jesus was born. And when I heard that, I remember picking up the phone and calling some older deacons in the church and said, who have you brought in here to preach to us? This guy must be a heretic. I mean, I've seen nativity scenes all my life, and the wise men have always been there. But the more I began to study this story, the more I realized that he was right. In fact, did you notice when I read the text that the Bible does not refer to Jesus as a baby or an infant? but as a child. The Greek term is usually used to refer to a child about one and a half years of age. And when the wise men got there, if you were paying attention, they didn't go to the the manger or find Jesus in a barn. The Bible says when they found him in the house. And so while the wise men were not typically associated with the nativity scene in the Bible, I would say this morning there's still some important insights we can learn from the way they celebrate Christmas that will help us to better celebrate Christmas. So there are three things I want to draw or or lift out of this biblical narrative that will help us to have a greater knowledge of and appreciation for this sacred season. So note with me, first of all, that in order to properly celebrate Christmas, we must have faith in the Word of God. We must have faith in the Word of God. Now, I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm about to say. Our belief system must be based on the contents of the Holy Bible. We are blessed to have so many religious resources at our disposal. Our denomination produces many printed materials. Lifeway is the largest producer of Christian literature in the world. You can take your cell phone or go on your computer and you can go to various websites. You can go to YouTube and you can hear all sorts of people delivering all sorts of sermons on all sorts of subjects. And this is a good thing, but it is imperative that we make sure that what we read, what we hear, and what we believe carefully corresponds to the contents of the sacred scripture. By extension, what we believe about Christmas should come from the pages of God's holy word. I say this because some of the things that are typically associated with Christmas are derived from songs rather than 
scripture. This is particularly true when it comes to the visit that was made by the wise men. Much of what people believe about the wise men is derived from a song written by John Henry Hopkins in the year 1857. The song to which I'm referring is We Three Kings. We sang it earlier in our service this morning. And while I am certain the writer of this hymn never meant to deliberately mislead people, some of the lines of this song simply do not line up with Scripture. For example, as you may recall, this familiar hymn begins with the lines, We Three Kings. Now, the songwriter's assumption was due to the fact that the Scripture says they brought three gifts that there must have been three people. But that is pure speculation. It could have been three people bringing three gifts. It could have been two people bringing three gifts. It could have been six people bringing three gifts. We really just don't know. The song also identifies the Magi as kings. We three kings. But once again, the scriptures are silent regarding any political position these men may have occupied. In fact, in all probability, they were not kings. They are simply identified in verse 1 as magi. Magi were men who studied the stars. These men identified in the Bible as magi were skilled in two academic disciplines or areas of study. Those areas were astronomy and astrology. Astronomy is a study of the movement of the stars. Astrology is assigning meaning to the movement of the stars. Most of us believe in astronomy, but not all of us believe in astrology, okay? But during the period in which Jesus was born, people believed in both astronomy and astrology. They were fascinated by the movement of the stars, and people who gave interpretation to the movement of the stars were regarded as being intelligent people. That's why we've come to refer to these people as the wise men. Now, another misconception we have about these magi is that they came from the Orient, We three kings of Orient are. You remember the song? But there's no biblical indication that they came from the Orient or even from the Far East. They may have come from the East, but probably not the Far East. Many scriptural scholars believe that the wise men came from Iraq. And during biblical days, Iraq was the equivalent of Babylon. Iraq or Babylon was about 540 miles from Jerusalem. Now, as you might imagine, the arrival of these men into town must have been big news. In all probability, they came on camels wearing long flowing robes and expensive jewelry. And when they arrived, they must have been the talk of the town. Everybody was talking about these strange men who have arrived in Jerusalem. When they got there, they asked this important question. Where is he who's been born the king of the Jews? And then they went on to say, we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, please keep in mind, the first point in this message is, in order to properly celebrate Christmas, we must have faith in the word of God. So how does this point relate to the wise men? And the answer to this question is this, the wise men knew about the king of the Jews as well as this special star from the word of God. Now, let me explain how I drew this conclusion. Keep in mind, the wise men came from Babylon. One of the Old Testament characters who played a prominent role in Babylon was Daniel. Daniel was carried away into Babylonian captivity when he was just a young man. But Daniel was a man who had faith in God. And during that period of history, people only had access to the first five books of the Bible, known as the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Daniel, as you may recall from your study of the scriptures, eventually ascended to a prominent position in the kingdom of Babylon. And and get this, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 48, we're informed that the king of Babylon placed Daniel over his wise men. And knowing what we know about Daniel, there can be little doubt that Daniel taught those wise men the contents of the first five books of the Bible. And one of the insights the wise men must have learned from the sacred scriptures and then passed down to subsequent generations of wise men was that a special star was going to appear. They studied this from the book of Numbers. This is what Numbers says in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will rise out of Israel. They knew that 
One day there would be a king born to Israel. And there'd be a special star to signify his birth. Now stick with me here because this is so important. The wise men follow the star they knew about from the word of God to Jerusalem. And when they got there, they inquired, where's the one who's been born the king of the Jews? Herod heard this question and he called together his chief priests and teachers of the law and inquired of them, where was the Messiah to be born? They responded, in Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. The information about where the Messiah had been born was revealed in the word of God. This comes from the book of Micah. Now, the wise men are learning more and more about the word of God. Previously, they just knew about the Torah that had been passed down to them, but now they're being taught by the chief priests and teachers of the law that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. So get this, the wise men have now traveled over 500 miles. And upon hearing that the king of the Jews had been born in Bethlehem, they realized we are almost there, just five more miles. And so here's the takeaway. Here's what we need to get out of this point. The star, are you ready? The star led the wise men to Jerusalem, but it was the scriptures that led the wise men to Jesus. When we gaze into the stars, if you go out on, on your patio tonight or your back deck and you look up into the sky and you see the stars, you're reminded that there is a God. And when you say the scriptures, you're taught about who the God is. And so if we want to properly celebrate Christmas, we must have faith in the word of God. This is what the word of God is all about. It's about Jesus. Christmas is about Jesus. And like the wise men, we need to have faith in the word of God. And what we believe about Christmas should not come simply from a secular psalm, but from the sacred scriptures. In order to properly celebrate Christmas, we must have faith in the Word of God. And then secondly, we must follow the will of God. Now, I want to share with you some things you, you may not be aware of. When we come to verses 7 through 10 in today's text, we see a distinct difference in regard to the star the wise men mention in verse 2. And this difference, please don't miss this, is that the star began to move. Initially, this star was stationary over Jerusalem. But now the star begins to move, the Bible tells us, and they follow the star until it stopped over the place where the child lay. The word of God led them to do the will of God. Here's the takeaway. God's will is to lead people to Jesus. It's so simple and yet it's so significant. Where God was leading the wise men is where God wants to lead people today. He wants to lead us to Jesus. We might say that Jesus was a star of the Christmas story and Jesus wants to star or play the leading role in your life and in my life. Just as Christmas is about Jesus, our lives should be about Jesus. Now there's one more cool thing I wanna point out about this star. I don't know a lot about astronomy, but I've been trying to study just a little bit, some basic things in reference to this star. And here's what I've discovered. When we think about the movement of the stars, the stars move from east to west. Now, in reality, the stars don't move, okay? But because our earth rotates, we are moving. But it is our perception that the stars move from east to west. Y'all with me here? Do your head like that, okay? We think the stars move from east to west. But in today's text, I want you to get this, the star moved from north to south, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, five miles south. And what I'm trying to point out to you is this was a supernatural act of God. We are seeing God's divine intervention as he is bringing people to Jesus. If we want to properly celebrate Christmas, we must have faith in the word of God then we must follow the will of God, and those two things will cause us to focus our worship on the Son of God. 
That's precisely what the wise men did when they came to Jesus. When they got there, they knelt down and they gave Jesus gifts. They didn't give him a Nintendo, a football, a basketball, a Samaritan Jordan Nikes. They gave him some rather strange gifts. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And yet when we consider those gifts, it becomes immediately apparent that the wise men didn't just grab something on their way out the door and say, hey, we'll just take these to Jesus. This was not some last minute shopping spree on Christmas Eve as is typical of most men. Instead, they carefully considered the gifts they were going to bring. The first gift was gold. And everyone who lived in the first century A.D. understood the significance of gold. Gold was a gift for a king. By presenting Jesus, this babe, with gold, it was like saying, here is a king in waiting. He is sovereign. He is not just a king, but he is king of kings and Lord of lords. Then there was a second gift. This gift was brought to Jesus and perhaps the top was removed and all of a sudden frankincense began to fill the room with its fragrance. Frankincense was not a gift you would give to a person. It was a gift used in the context of worship of God. The wise men were saying, with gold, he is sovereign. With frankincense, he is sacred. This is not just another baby boy. This is God in the flesh. And we know this to be true from the contents of Matthew, where it says, call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Gold. He is sovereign. He is king. Frankincense. He is sacred. He is God. And then myrrh. Myrrh was used to embalm dead bodies. Bodies were embalmed externally. They would wrap them in linen and and beneath the sheets, they would begin to put myrrh in there. Cover up the smell of the dead body. What a gift for a baby. But it was signifying that we know he's not just sovereign. He's not just sacred, but he is the Savior. In order to be our Savior, he must die. And I would say to you this morning, we can't look at the cradle without seeing the cross. We can't look at the cradle without seeing the cross, the cross upon which Jesus died. And so we learn how to celebrate Christmas from the wise men. They are saying, he is sovereign, he is sacred, he is savior. And so today, today we would do well to imitate the example of the wise men. And crown Jesus as our king. We would do well to follow the example of the wise men and recognize this is sacred. We're on holy ground. Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. And just as he was alive within Mary's womb for nine months, he is alive in the heart of every born-again believer 
in Jesus Christ. Sovereign and sacred. And if you want to properly celebrate Christmas, you must make Jesus your Savior. If you have never been saved, I plead with you to open God's Christmas gift and know that for God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, that if you would believe in him, you won't perish, but you'll have everlasting life. That you'll say yes to Jesus and thank you to God for this great gift. Well, the wise men may not have been present at the manger, but they got there. Some of you have been hearing the Christmas story for years and years and years, and you've never really got there maybe until today. Today, maybe for the first time, you've arrived at the point where you understand that Jesus truly is sovereign. He's sacred, and he's Savior. And I pray that you would give a gift today to Jesus, that you would give him your heart, that you would make your heart his home. And as a result, you will experience Christmas as never before. I pray this Christmas It'll be very personal and very profound for you. Don't get so caught up in the presence that you forget the presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who came to save you from your sin. Bow with me, please. Father, thank you for sending your Son to be our Savior. And Father, during these moments of quiet, personal reflection, I pray that every person here would search their hearts to see if your son has taken up permanent residence there. For those who need to be saved, I pray today would be the day of salvation. And for those of us who have already been saved, I pray this Christmas might truly be personal and profound. So speak to our hearts as we wait quietly before you.
that saved a wretch like me. Christmas. God bless you. You are dismissed in the name of Jesus.